Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So this is yet another video that I promised a part two on forever and ever and ever ago. So we are finally here. It was a hit last time. So we're back again talking about artists most hated and most regretted songs. So these are gonna be songs that an artist either just doesn't really care for anymore. Maybe they didn't care for it at the time that they recorded and released it. Or otherwise, maybe they're neutral towards the song or at least they don't hate it. But they regret some of the fallout, some of the after effects of the song coming out. And then in some cases, they just didn't wanna release it for whatever reason, but it's out there now. So let's go ahead and get into talking about some of these songs. I'm in love with the shape of you. We push and pull like a magnet do. If Shape of You has one fan, it's me, and if it has none, I am dead. But apparently Ed Sheeran himself is not a big fan of the song at all. Ed actually wrote Shape of You for Rihanna, which I did already know, but I still just can't believe that he ever intended for anyone else to have this song because it just sounds like such an Ed Sheeran song to me. But Ed said that as he was writing it, he couldn't picture anyone other than Rihanna singing the lyrics, nor did he think Shape of You would even perform well on the charts. So he did decide to keep the song for himself and finish it, though he wasn't sure where the song would end up or on what project. Originally, he didn't even want to put Shape of You on his album Divine, and he actually had to be convinced to do it. He said about this, Shape of You was actually the only song that I was like, this isn't me at all. It took Johnny and Steve, the guys I wrote it with, probably about a month or two to convince me that it should even be on the album, and probably took them another month to convince me that it should be a single. After deciding to put it on Divide, Ed changed some of the lyrics to make Shape of You more gender neutral. And clearly, he didn't at all predict the song's international success. About six months after its release, Shape of You became the most streamed song of all time in the UK, but now it's in second place. Shape of You was the best performing song of 2017, and it remained number one in the US for 16 weeks. It's now the second most streamed song on Spotify, though it does hold the distinction of holding the number one spot the longest. And additionally, Shape of You won at a Grammy in 2018 for Best Pop Solo Performance. And we'll never be royal. All the way back in 2014, so I think the song may have even still been on the charts at the time, Lord admitted that Royals, her smash breakout single, wasn't her best song. She said in an Australian interview at the time, I understand why it worked and why it was kind of a hit. I can see those qualities in it, but at the same time, there's part of me that's like, these melodies are just not as good as something that I could have written now. Or like, I definitely wouldn't have written this lyric this way if I had have written it now. It definitely feels like a bit of a relic now. I will say personally that I do kind of get what she's saying. I feel like Royals, at least for me, what drew me to this song was that pulled back minimalist production because I don't really remember having heard a song like that before. But I will say lyrically, even with the melodies, Lord does have stronger songs than that first EP. I would say the title track and especially Bravado. And at the time that she gave this interview, her debut album, Pure Heroin, was out already, and Royals is also on that. News to me, but Lord almost didn't even put Royals on Pure Heroin. And even on that project, I do feel like she's got bigger standouts like Buzz Cut Season, Still Sane, and White Teeth Teens. And I think at the time that Lord gave this interview, she was promoting the other singles on Pure Heroin, Team, and Glory and Gore. I remember at the time, though, when Royals was blowing up, people would ask Lord in interviews and be like, oh, how do you write like such an adult or from this grown perspective? And are typically responding like, I kind of don't and can't because I've never been older than I am. And so seeing her get a little bit older, even if it was only a year or so at that point, and thinking that she could have done the song better kind of speaks to that. And since her comments on Royals were when the song had only been out for a little under a year, I did wonder if she's changed her mind since because I do feel like it's easier to be harder on yourself in your more recent past, but then after all that time goes by, it's easier to be like, oh, I was just a kid, I was doing my best in that moment. Just because I could have done better with skills I have now that I didn't have back then doesn't mean it wasn't great. And it does look like as of 2021, she's still not too fond of Royals, because Lord did say in another interview that year, I listened to people covering the song and putting their own spin on it, and I listened to it in every single form except the original one I put out, and I realized that actually it sounds horrible. It sounds like a ringtone from a 2006 Nokia. None of the melodies are cool or good. So still not a fan of her version, not a fan of the melodies in her version, but it is cool that she likes and listens to the covers. So this is not a song, but rather a whole album. And SZA has said that she's not much of a fan of her debut album, Control, which to so many people other than her was an instant classic. Like being a young adult when this album came out, you had to be there, and a lot of y'all probably were. In 2018, about a year after Control came out, that's when SZA revealed her feelings on the project. 
According to an interview she gave the fader, Scissor Set Control wasn't necessarily a planned out album, or the concept itself wasn't planned, it was just a collection of her songs that had been put together. She said, I just made a gang of songs over the course of four years, heard them all together and was like, huh, all right. And this is funny to me because I do remember when I was talking about SOS and was saying as much as I like most of the songs, the project didn't feel as cohesive as Control. Like, yeah, you can find cohesion in something that is unplanned, but I just assume that it was planned and they went into it with a concept. But honestly, I just feel like this is how SZA is because she said several times she'll just keep adding and recording more songs for an album because the project never feels finished enough or never feels good enough. And she even said when Love Galore went platinum, Donald Glover asked her if she felt the song was good enough now and she responded saying she still didn't really know. And she later said, I didn't even fuck with my own album, so I was so confused and almost like angry that everyone fucked with it so much. It meant everything I felt about myself was wrong. And it was just like, if that's not the truth, then what is the truth? And really, I do think that two things can be true, but I get her point, especially if the music was written from a personal place. It probably is weird to see how you expressing your own feelings doesn't even feel real to you or you don't like how you did it, but somehow it still resonates with other people. Despite not being a big fan of Control though, SZA did say that she was still upset losing all five of her Grammy nominations for her work on the album. And at first I was like, um, why would you care if you didn't think it was good? But I guess it's also like, even if I don't like it, y'all thought it was good enough to nominate five times, but somehow not good enough to win anything. And I was curious to know if there were any tracks SZA especially hated or liked on Control, or whether she was just mostly indifferent to the entire album. And unfortunately, I can only find her doing that for SOS, so I guess we'll never know how she feels more about the specific tracks on Control, but lukewarm maybe dislike, I guess, unfortunately. This song was certified diamond on my little iPod Nano. But in 2014, Ellie Jackson of LaRue came out saying that she did not want another hit like Bulletproof. The indie electronic song, which was released back in 2009, went number one in the duo's home territory of the UK, and about a year later cracked the top 10 in the US. And since, the song has been remixed several times, gone viral on TikTok a few times as part of different trends. And it's been remembered as one of those pop relics of its time, and I think one of those songs that you either loved or you hated. Bulletproof actually was the third single from the duo's self-titled debut, and Ellie said that she actually hadn't thought of making the song a single. She told the Digital Spy. It was just obviously a massive hit. I loved it at the time, but I don't think it was my favorite. In For The Kill was my favorite, or maybe even Tiger Lily or Colorless Color. With Bulletproof, we just knew which was exciting. If I could watch the Bulletproof video now, I wish I could erase it. In For The Kill is a bop too, so I can get why it was a favorite. And I have noticed a lot of artists say this, that the song that really blew up for them, even if they don't hate it, it just wasn't their favorite or the song they personally would have made a single. Ellie made an interesting point that when a lot of these songs blow up the way that Bulletproof did, especially if the song is some type of pop, you saw it being taken seriously or respected as an artist. And partly because of that, Bulletproof's popularity was the source of a lot of anxiety because now you're open up to people outside of your fan base, and that was the biggest reason she didn't want a song to blow up like that ever again. Ellie said in that same interview that for years it had been hard for markets to figure out where to place her because she wasn't the same artist as when Bulletproof was released five years ago at that point. Probably especially frustrating when it's your debut, so you're relatively new, maybe still figuring things out, and people come to expect a specific song for the rest of your career, but it's one that you put out pretty early into your career. And then, since that song was a massive hit, you also do feel pressure to replicate those numbers, and sometimes your recording contract can depend on it. I knew I was never going to write another song like Bulletproof. Like, it's the most poppy, like young kind of sounding thing I've ever written you know I feel like I have to go back in time and be a 17 year old to perform it and when you're like 28 or whatever that's not as easy as it sounds like just be 17 again be like I'm like what the hell so not necessarily a case of her hating the song itself just sort of being neutral towards it and then regretting how the song performed in years after that Digital Spy interview from 2014, Ellie did another interview in 2020 saying she felt her music career had been a catalog full of errors and that Bulletproof and some other songs didn't really fit her sets when she was performing and so it was hard to embody them and give a believable performance. I didn't realize that she was 17 when they made this song and she also said that when she does perform Bulletproof now, she'll do a remix version of the song instead of the original.
A famous example of an artist writing a song at 17 that they no longer stand by is definitely Paramore's Misery Business, released in 2007. The band actually retired the song in 2018, announcing at that time that they wouldn't be performing it for a little while. The song was retired because the lyrics were considered to be unfeminist and the band, especially Haley Williams, was receiving criticism online for still performing it. Even a couple years before retiring Misery Business, Haley had done a few interviews distancing herself from the lyrics. She said in 2017, The problem with the lyrics is not that I had an issue with someone I went to school with. It's the way I try to call her out using words that didn't belong in the conversation. And other than people taking issue with the song's theme overall, in the second verse, Haley sings, Once a whole year, nothing more. I'm sorry, that'll never change, which is one of the main lines that people took issue with. And before that, back in 2015, Haley had said the lyrics were ones that she hadn't related to as a then 26-year-old woman. And in 2020, she actually called out Spotify for putting the song in their Women of Rock playlist, saying that while she was appreciative of what the song did for the band and for her career, it had nothing to do with female empowerment. And a couple years later, in 2022, Paramore actually did begin performing Misery Business again, with Haley claiming, Four years ago, we said we were going to retire the song for a little while, and I guess technically we did. But what we did not know was that just about five minutes after I got canceled for saying the word whore in a song, all of TikTok decided that it was okay. Make it make sense. She also performed the song Billie Eilish at Coachella that year and said that she initially hadn't wanted Billie to cover it and actually tried to talk her out of it, though they ended up performing it together. And Haley said about this, It shouldn't be about me. People grow and learn. I'd already called myself out and done a lot of work on the misogyny I'd metabolized as a young girl. Only now that we felt lighter about the band, it's like I don't feel defined by that song. I do feel like a lot of female artists have a I'm not like other girls song or a putting down girls song that they wrote when they were pretty young that they have come to regret, which is probably because that I'm not like other girls is a phase a lot of us went through before realizing it's silly and probably a bit or a lot of it is internalized misogyny that you hopefully will unlearn with age. I know Taylor Swift has said this about Better Than Revenge, and I also know that Marina said this about her song, Girls. In Better Than Revenge, Taylor took out the lyrics about the girl in question being known for what she does on the mattress rather than being an actress in her re-recording of the song. And Marina said that she meant for girls to be a song that was supportive of women, but it got misconstrued because of some of the lyrics like, Girls, they never be from me because I fall asleep when they speak of all the calories they eat. She later said that she cringes at the song, and though it was mostly about her dieting issues, which is something that she was thinking a lot of other girls could relate to, she didn't stand by some of the lyrics anymore. But back to Misery Business, I saw some online saying that now when Paramore performs the song, Haley just lets the audience sing that one line if they want to, so it's sort of a loophole in a sense, and it allows the fans to still get to hear the song, but then Haley didn't technically sing the questionable line. This one hurts my heart, but I love my good sis Normani, and she has said in interviews that she didn't really want to release Motivation, which was her solo debut. The song was originally a collaboration between Ariana Grande, Max Martin, and Ilya, but the demo was then passed on to Normani. And based on the reference track that surfaced online last year, only the pre-chorus and chorus had been written, and some finishing touches were added to the production in Normani's version. In 2021, Normani said in an interview with Zach saying that Motivation was only released because so much money had gone into the song and the video as well, I'm assuming, and she also needed something out in time to perform at the VMAs. And what actually pushed you to do it? I mean, I, I didn't have a, a choice. <laughs> a lot of money was spent. <laughs> <laughs> it was to the point where, okay, so I was performing for the VMAs, right? Yeah. And in order to perform, I had to release the record. Looking back, you know? are you happy it came out or do you wish no, you would No, I'm, abs I'm absolutely happy. I'm proud of what I did. I forgot this song came out so close to the VMAs, it was released just 10 days before. But I do love Motivation, and I think it would have been cool to see Normani do music more in that direction because I think it worked really well in her, but I also get that it wouldn't make sense and it's probably not going to happen since she doesn't really want to do pop, it seems. Because even though Motivation is definitely the most pop-leaning song that she's released solo, it still definitely got some R&B influences in it, and then her releases after that even have more of an R&B influence. And it seems to be the same case for some of the songs that she's teasing from Dopamine right now, and I am very much excited and eager regardless to see what she's got cooking with this new album, because we're getting the first single soon, so I am excited for 159. Back in 2001, Destiny's Child released their booty-positive anthem, aptly titled Bootylicious. 
The song, which was a response to criticisms over Beyonce's body, actually sampled Stevie Nicks' Edge of 17, and Beyonce said the guitar riff in that song actually reminded her of a voluptuous woman, she said in 2002. I wrote that song because I was getting bigger and bigger and I just wanted to talk about it. I like to eat and that's a problem in this industry. I'm still probably twice as big as any of the other actresses out there and that's a constant grind that I really hate to have to worry about. Initially, producer Rob Fusari wanted to sample the riff looped in Eye of the Tiger, which would have been a funny coincidence considering it was for DC's album Survivor and Eye of the Tiger is a song by the group Survivor. Fusari said about this, Needless to say, Matthew was adamant about not replacing that loop because I knew it was going to come with a significant sample fee and a copyright that Stevie Nicks would want, and sure enough, it did. It was 50% of everything. He said the record is perfect the way it is, so I didn't get to change that. We kind of had a pissing match in terms of what the record needed. Though some believe Beyonce invented the word bootylicious, it had been used before by Snoop Dogg in his feature on Dre Day, released back in 1993, and had been referenced other times throughout the 90s. The Destiny's Child song going number one definitely helped bring the term into more mainstream consciousness though, something Beyonce would openly regret a couple years later. In 2004, the word was added to the Oxford English Dictionary, and I also saw sources claiming it's in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, so it may be in both. The year following, Beyonce said that she hated the word and said that it was something that everyone was starting to use to describe the group, she told Teen Hollywood. Every time someone introduces us now, it's the bootylicious Destiny's Child. If I had known it was going to have this life of its own, I would have given it a different definition. And she said a couple years later in a separate interview that if she knew the song would have put a word in the dictionary, she would have chosen a different word altogether. Apparently, Beyonce also isn't the biggest fan of Check On It. This song was released in 2005 and used to promote the Pink Panther film, but actually didn't make it onto the soundtrack. And Check On It was only made a single because Stand Up For Love, a Destiny's Child song, didn't perform well and actually failed to chart. Check On It, however, went number one, where it remained for five weeks. And while I was researching, I saw articles being like, yup, this song is annoying, so no surprise there that Beyonce doesn't like it. And I've always thought it was fun, so I was kind of surprised to figure out that people don't like it. And I've noticed a lot of girls have been recreating looks from the video recently, especially this past Halloween. But no, I was looking through some posts on Pulse Music from that time, and it seems like people definitely were not feeling check on it. I also saw people in that Pulse Music forum commenting on how it didn't make much sense that the song was included on Destiny's Child's number one album, since it is a Beyonce song. And then someone else in the forum pointed out that maybe it was originally meant to be for the group, since Slim Thug and Swizz Beats both referenced DC in the song rather than Beyonce herself, so I'm not sure what the story is there. And then I'm sure you're familiar with the almost 20 year suspicion at this point that it is actually Kelly singing the second verse of the song, but she wasn't credited. And as of 2020, Michelle said that Kelly was singing backup, but many are still convinced that that's Kelly singing lead, so who knows. Regardless, Beyonce said that she dislikes Check On It because the song is simple and not in a catchy way, and so she was surprised that other people actually did like it. So as time has gone by, this is a song that she's more or less stopped performing, but she did treat fans with a performance of it at Coachella, making it very clear it was for them. Tones and I said that she's not too fond of her hit song, Dance Monkey. And I have to admit that I'm honestly not either, but definitely not to the extent that death threats feel deserved, which I mentioned she received over the song back when I did my video on Cringe. Back in 2019, she said the relentless bullying followed all of her proud moments, so she couldn't even fully appreciate the song doing so well. Now, as of last month, it's been estimated the song made $15 million on Spotify alone, though reports from February said the song made around $12 million. But either way, Dance Monkey makes Tones and I the first female artist to have a song hit 3 billion streams on Spotify. Tones and I said later in 2022 that after the song blew up, the writers and producers she was working with were basically trying to remake the song and recapture its success. She said, I wrote that song on my own, not trying to do a single thing, and it happened. But I don't want to just try to chase that song. I loathe that song a lot of the time. A lot of the times I don't want to sing it. I'm not going to write another song like it, I just want to tell people how I'm feeling. And this is sadly ironic considering that Dance Monkey, as happy and upbeat as it sounds, is about feeling like being forced to perform and losing the love for it, inspired by Tones and I's experience busking and performing in bars before the song blew up. It was kind of unclear to me whether she hated the song itself or simply just hated that it was overplayed, led to the bullying, and she felt boxed in by it. I'm sure the latter plays a big role, but it probably could be both. Tones and I did also say that despite the death threats and the bullying, which she didn't see an end in sight to, she would continue making music. And it looks like she's made good on that promise, having released quite a few non-album singles and some singles this year that might be leading up to an album. 
And I was curious to see what her other songs sound like because I've only ever heard Dance Monkey from her. And I listened to some of her releases from this year and they're definitely still relatively upbeat, but not with that grating electronic production that Dance Monkey has. And even on her 2019 EP, which contains Dance Monkey, that song is the most quote unquote annoying song on there, but a lot of them do have that playful, whimsical element to them that Dance Monkey has. And knowing what that song's about, it just sounds like an exaggeration of her music to the point of it being overwhelming, maybe even frustrating, I would say. But yeah, like I said, while the death threats are definitely inappropriate, I can completely understand not being fond of Dance Monkey and getting why Tones and I may not like it either. So I want to end by touching on Dua Lipa because in the comments of the first video I did on this topic, a couple people put Dua's names down in the comments and I was like, mm, I kind of relatively keep up with Dua Lipa and I've never heard a case of her saying that she doesn't like one of her songs. And so I did do some research and look into it and from what I found is that she said in a few interviews is that she never really listens to her own music unless it happens to come on where she's somewhere like on the radio or if she's out at a club or a party, her music comes on, she's fine with it. And I do think that that is something that is pretty normal for artists for them to just not go out of their way to listen to their own music similar to how a lot of actors say that they don't necessarily watch their own movies or their shows and a lot of content creators don't watch their own content and it's not always because they don't like it or they think it's bad even though maybe it is in some cases it's usually because it's not as exciting because you know exactly what's coming exactly what's gonna happen exactly how it was made and you've probably just spent so much time with it that it's not novel and enjoyable to you anymore so I think that was pretty much the case with Dua but that being said there are several artists who do listen to their own music I feel like if I was a little pop star little artist I probably would turn my music off anytime it came on but I would have that one song or two where I was like nah I ate that we gotta let it play and I'm gonna dance to it but as always do be sure to let me know your thoughts let me know your feelings down below in the comments do you hate any of these songs do you dislike any of these songs like the artist were there some that surprised you and last but not least bootylicious featured in this video and i actually had it in mind for a topic for another video which was going to be songs where artists are like f the critics whether they mean the actual critics whether they mean the fans so let me know if that's a topic that you're interested in because i've got some songs chosen that i can make a video out of but yeah let me know if that's something that you would want to see as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. And if you'd like to become a channel member and get early access to videos, the link is in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching. I love you all so very much, and we'll see you so very soon. Bye-bye.